The following program is made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America. City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. and the Harold Thurman Endowment. Present Spotlight. Welcome to the Harold Thurman Seminar on Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is one of America's foremost playwrights, Mr. Edward Albee. Edward, welcome. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Nice to have you here. I wanted to mention, you have a play called Listening. And in that play, one of the characters, the girl, says, you hear me, but you don't listen. If I, is that more or less the... As I remember it, that, yeah. That, that, that's the line. Uh -huh. Do you think that it would be fair to say that for both critics and audiences to really understand your plays properly and to get the most out of them, they should listen to them and not just hear them. Well, of course, uh, hearing rather than listening is, is, a, is, is a waste of anybody's time. But for anybody to really get the full experience of any play, no matter whether it's tough or easy or avant-garde or, or retrograde, <clears throat> good or bad for that matter, you've got to go to the theater and wipe the slate clean and make every theatrical experience the first play you've ever seen. So you don't go with any expectation of what a play is meant to be like or what the actor did before or what the playwright did before. Uh, first play. Right. Ever been written? You know, when I write a play, uh, I, I try to forget the other 25 that I've written. I, I try to forget the, the 500 great plays that have been written uh, throughout history that I've learned from. I, and I try to write the first play that's ever been written. And when I go to the theater, I try to have the, the absolute fresh experience. So, sure, I listen hard, but I also listen for the first time. And that's so important. Do you, well, that really is a, a sort of approach. It's an attitude that most people, I think, don't have, even including a lot of people in the theater, mm -hmm. don't you think? Sure. And probably a lot of critics, too, because critics come with a lot of baggage, I think, when they uh, come to see a play. I mean, yours or anybody else's, but certainly someone who has a body of work. Uh, don't you think they come with a lot of preconceptions? About they come with a lot of preconceptions of half the time, half of them, whether they're going to like the play uh, before they've seen it. They've made up their mind about that, depending upon whether the playwright is in or out or this or that. Uh, sure, uh, there's a lot of prejudice and a lot of baggage, as you say, that both uh, critics and audiences, uh, civilian audiences, and indeed professional theater people uh, bring to, the, uh, uh, to a play. Before we get away from this notion of wiping the slate clean and the, the first time experience, uh, the audience then, and, and critics obviously, who, who are audience members, uh, should come really without any, with as few preconceptions as possible and open to whatever happens on the stage there, that is whether it's realistic or non-realistic, whether it's fantastic, whether it's whatever unfolds in front of them. An audience is more likely to do that as an individual than any critic is. Because every critic, even the fairest, the most intelligent, and the best, bring with them some notion that they have as to what the nature of theater should be. And that is prejudicial, sometimes uh, for the good, sometimes for the bad. So it's very difficult for a, for a critic who's trying to shape the theater in his own image of what the theater is meant to, is meant to, meant to be. Uh, whether it's meant to belong to the audience, uh, the avant-garde, or whatever, it's almost impossible for a critic to accomplish that. Well, can you accomplish it? No, not I mean, in all so. honesty, yeah. I, I can't. And you, you can't totally, although you try to as when you go, because you have such a background of theatrical knowledge yourself. But I find that the very, very best plays I can do it in, if I'm at a play by Beckett or somebody else, and uh, it's a good production, uh, I can have the first-time experience. But if it's a bad play and badly acted, and I can see the direction, and, and I can see the holes in the playwriting, I can s probably see those quicker than, than a civilian right. will. But with a, with a first-rate play, 
No, I can lose it. You absolutely sort of immerse yourself. Yeah. And there's course. also a, there's a quality of innocence about this that mm -hmm. you're talking sure about. Sure there is. Now, the other thing I wanted to, though, before we get on to some other things, is this wiping the slate clean notion. You said that you also do that as a writer. And uh, well, when, I, you, when I, you sit down <laughs> to write a play, I mean, in, in terms of the genesis of a play, first of all, where do, what is the, the genesis? I mean, not, I mean, obviously, each one's going to be different, but what is a, do you get a, a, an idea in terms of a situation, a group of characters, an incident, or a memory? What is it? Do With you? the exception of one play, The Death of Bessie Smith, which I specifically wrote because of my, <coughs> my I was enraged about reading how, how Bessie Smith died. Remember the story? Right. Killed in, the in 1937 outside of Memphis, uh, hurt in an automobile accident, uh, taken to one hospital. She was bleeding to death and she was refused admission. It was a white hospital and she was black. So with the exception of that play, which I wrote in my anger uh, uh, over, over that incident and racial prejudice in general, with the exception of that play, I've never known where they've come from. I have discovered that I have been that I have been thinking about a play, and then when I become aware of it, uh, part of the work's done. So I never really know, which which it, must mean that creativity resides in the unconscious, or certainly in in the enormous part of my brain, uh, which doesn't tell me what it's doing. So it's been ob obviously it's been. Uh forming mm. in the back of your head somewhere for front, long before you back, recognize front, it. wherever, yeah. yeah. And, and the characters are, are evolving, uh, the situation, the destination at least is there. It comes into focus slowly. It's sort of hazy at first. So really for you, this becomes a process of discovery about what has been going on in your own oh, sure. imagination oh, yeah. and head. You discover what you've already been uh, thinking about or, or fantasizing or imagining or whatever. You know, creativity is a terribly dangerous and tricky thing to talk about, but as close as I can figure it out, um, the majority of initial creativity takes place without our being, the creative artist being aware of it. Uh, aware that he is aware of it at any rate. Yeah, sure, the mind is doing it. It's only when it comes into the conscious mind and we have to start applying all of the rules that we've learned, all of the techniques, all of the experience, all of the, the craft talent that we have. It's then that we bring together the, 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 the initial creative uh, aspect of the play uh, with all of the craft and all the rest of it. And so for me at any rate, there are some uh, playwrights who are completely didactic who say now it is time to write a play about uh, Nicaragua. Uh, whichever side they happen to be on. Um, and then they get uh, characters in a situation and, and uh, they create some kind of agitprop or certainly didactic play about Nicaragua. But the rest of us um, trust our creative instincts to come up with interesting, for us at any rate, uh, interesting uh, theatrical concepts. But obviously in your case, and of course this is the difference between a playwright on the one hand and maybe a novelist or something, your ideas come to you in terms of the stage, in terms of dramatic situations. Right? I learned that. I, I hadn't thought about that uh, until oh, about eight or ten years ago. Yes, uh, when I get an idea for a play and I start seeing it and hearing it in my mind, especially when I'm writing it down, when I get to the point of writing it down, I see it as a play not as some kind of amorphous dramatic experience, but I see it being, being performed on a stage. I see it acted, and I see it acted on a stage. In other words, I, do, I don't see it as real people. I see it as actors being real people, and, and I see it performed not in some kind of oh, general area, but very specifically on a stage, usually a proscenium stage. You, really, you, you visualize then that picture frame stage in most cases. Then, I can't people... imagine that a choreographer <coughs> does anything different. A, cho a choreographer, uh, when he envisions the choreography for a piece, well, he's building that in his mind. He must see it being danced by dancers on a stage. When a composer composes music, he hears it performed by, uh, uh, by instrumentalists. It, it, it's, I don't see why it's so surprising to anybody that we playwrights do it the same way. In a way, you almost take dictation from yourself, I mm -hmm. mean, from what you, what you've, uh, when you write, well, as we you write it down. Yeah, we don't always take dictation. We, we, we sometimes we don't like what the dictation is, so we change you it. Change it. <laughs> you mean as it filters through yeah, sure. looking at it the next day or mm -hmm. after it's written down. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But one of the things that, that is interesting about what you've just said about visualizing it as you write it, 
I assume this explains why you put such very specific stage directions in a lot of your plays. That is, how, char how characters, how a line is being said, what, what's going on in that character's mind. I put down what I see and what I hear. What you see and hear. And sometimes I'll, I'll, it's very specific. Yeah, it is, because I make the assumption that what I see and hear may be useful to the actor and the director and, and the reader uh, to, get, to, get a, to get as close as they possibly can uh, to what I intended or what I thought I intended. But there's another aspect to this too because for the last, well you can tell me how many years, you've been directing your mm. own plays. Fifteen or so. Fifteen yeah. or so. And I presume this... Well, it's not exclusively, but I understand, I, but you've done, getting into the act. You've yeah. done a, a lot of directing mm -hmm. of your own plays and I presume this too is because you want to see up there on the stage uh, in, in real action, what you have imagined in your mind quite vividly. I think that's fair. Yeah, oh no, I'm not saying no. it's not fair, but I mean, <laughs> if, if I'm just play, trying to explain yeah. why you, maybe as opposed to some other, well, some playwrights not, might not have the facility to be a director, that is, to deal with actors in space. Well, it takes a lot of experience, and there's a lot of craft involved in that. Yes, but... There are some playwrights who do not write very, very specifically. There are some playwrights who get general ideas and, and, and they can't focus. And then, therefore, they need directors and actors and, and, other, and other people's help uh, to bring, bring it into focus for them. I tell my playwriting students, don't, don't write too soon. Uh, keep a play what in your head. What do you mean by don't write too soon? Uh, you get the idea for a play. Don't race to the, to the, to the quill or the typewriter or, or, or God help them. The, the word uh, processor. That, that, that thing. <laughs> I tell them not to use the word processor since it's the writer who's supposed to process the words, not the machine. Um, they get the idea and then they race to the, to, to the typewriter to put it down. Let it, uh, let it develop for a while. Let, let it come more into focus. Uh, you'll probably have to make fewer changes and you'll probably have a better idea of uh, what's going on in, in the better part of your head. Do you, uh, I suppose one of the things that a writer might fear in wanting to race to the typewriter or the quill would be that he or she might forget one of those things, but you obviously don't worry about that. I don't think that um, you gain anything by uh, racing to put everything down. I've, I've come to the conclusion that anything that I, that I can't remember, consciously or unconsciously, is probably not worth remembering. I don't think I've ever lost anything. I've, over the years, I've made notes here and there, but I remember the famous thing I did, it's become famous because I talk about it all the time, <laughs> and while I was writing Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, uh, while I was writing the first act, I got uh, an idea of what should be in the third act, and I wrote three or four pages, and I kept them, so I wouldn't lose them, and I wouldn't forget them. And are they in the play? No, of course not. <laughs> By the time I got to the third act, I tried to stick them in the play, and the characters wouldn't speak them. So, uh, I never worry about that. Is there a point, from what you just said, is there a point in, in a lot of your plays where the characters have taken on such a life and such a personality and individuality that they do take over, they tell you what they would be saying next? No, they don't, they don't impose in that particular way. But uh, unless the reality <coughs> of the characters is sufficient, there's no point in, in trying to animate them. Uh, when you're animating, you're doing a, uh, a cheerful transference uh, from, uh, from your yeah. brain into the assumption of, uh, uh, of their personalities. Obviously, no character can say anything because it does, the, what the character does, says does not exist until you, the writer, write Pretty it down. Bad. But you play tricks and you play games with yourself. It's, it's a healthy transference. Of, of, you mean of you to them? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hmm. But there's a, does, is there a point at which they begin to develop a kind of personality or individuality or certain characteristics so that if you had in your mind, you mentioned this business about three or four pages in the third act, if you had it in your mind that something might happen in the second act or the third act, and the character has developed in such a way that he or she really wouldn't react that way. I would then. assume that I had lost momentary contact with the, uh, the purpose of the play. And I would stop until it came back. Now, when you were working on this, this idea of things forming in your mind before you rush to mm -hmm. write them down, does this go through uh, all the way through the play or a good way? I mean, uh, in a play like All Over or a play like uh, A Delicate Balance or what have you, does it go a good way through the play in your mind before you actually put it down? When I go to the pen or the typewriter to Which write... Which do you do, by the way? Do you it, do... it varies. You, do you use... Sometimes you... Yeah. 
the, the, the more naturalistic plays are, are done on the typewriter. The experimental ones are done uh, by hand, and they become experimental because I can't read my handwriting very carefully, <laughs> and so I put down whatever I think I wrote down, and therefore the plays are experimental. Uh, when I go write the first page of a play down on paper, I have absolutely no idea what the second page is going to be. So I don't think things through very, very specifically. In, in a sort of linear way. No, the, the destination is there, but I have absolutely no how, idea how I'm going to get from the beginning of the play to the end. I trust my knowledge of the play and the characters will, uh, and the healthy transference will accomplish that. But you have gotten some sense of who these people are and how oh, they relate I, to each other. I, I take them on long walks. I take my characters on long walks, something else I tell my students to do, um, to see how well I know them. And uh, I'll go for a walk on the beach, say, and think up some situation that will not, cannot be in the play. And I'll start improvising dialogue for the characters, put them in that situation. And if I can hear them, if they can handle themselves reasonably well, then I think I probably know them well enough to trust them in my play. Well, and obviously, and you've gotten to know them very well, mm -hmm. and they have also taken on a certain kind of three-dimensional quality, too. No point in writing stick figures. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I want to, something you mentioned a moment ago was, I thought, fascinating. Uh, about writing, whether it's naturalistic on the one hand, in which case you use the typewriter and experimental maybe or avant-garde or whatever, you uh, would do it in longhand. Uh, let talk a little bit about the relationship as far as you're concerned in the modern theater of naturalism and experimental. I hate all those terms. I know you do, but you brought it and up. I was sort of making a joke anyway. Yeah, you I brought it up. Uh, all plays are, all plays are realistic. And all plays are absolutely artificial at, right. the, at the same time, right? right. So, so all the terms are, are relative and, and, and ultimately absurd and useless. Um, uh, let, me, let me put this to you. A naturalistic you. play uh, does not do anything to the boundaries of the theater. Right. Uh, uh, an experimental avant-garde, uh, whatever kind of play you want to call it, does try to change the nature of theater. That's, that's the only valid distinction that, uh, that I me, can find. Let me ask you something on this very subject, though, because I've wondered about this in mm. terms of your plays. And your uh, first success was the Zoo Story, mm -hmm. which is a naturalistic It gives play. the illusion of yes, being a naturalistic exactly. play. It, yeah. it, it happens in Central Park, uh, mm -hmm. two people uh, who are, confront one another, and they, mm -hmm. they are Jerry and Peter. And uh, while there may be certain elements of it that are, and I've, as you say, the, all theater is, is, art, is an artifice in one mm -hmm. sense. It's an artifact of, of a kind. But it, it's, it can be taken on a very realistic level. And the same thing is true, really, of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. With, I mean, there are certain things in that play, uh, the imaginary child, well, th those the, two people were bright enough to invent an imaginary exactly. choice. You so, call uh, that a naturalistic play, but you can start getting in trouble with, with uh, other playwrights. Uh, isn't uh, Beckett's Waiting for Godot a naturalistic play? Well, but I'm going to come to something okay. here in a moment. All right, I mean, I, before I get off onto Beckett, yeah, I want to yeah. stick with Albie for a moment. Both of those plays, for whatever stretches they might have, mm -hmm. or whatever symbolic qualities are there, mm -hmm. or whatever, can be taken, let's put it that way, on a very realistic level, yeah, sure. and were by audiences. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose the question I'm really leading to is this, if it's possible that because they were so successful and so uh, completely accepted and by so many people, that then in some of your other plays, despite the fact that you'd wrote, written American Dream, which had uh, many uh, sort of fantastic mm -hmm. symbolic things in it. People go back and look in a house and a room has disappeared mm -hmm. and uh, the young man is really two people split in one and mm -hmm. I mean, w w w yeah. one person split in two. Um, I know a lot of those despite, people. Despite all of these things you'd had in some of your earlier plays, it seems to me then when you came to some of your later plays, uh, Tiny Alice of course, which, which came, but then some of your other plays, The Lady from Dubuque where uh, the two characters that come in, Elizabeth and Oscar, and are not totally, nobody knows quite who they mm -hmm. are. Or Seascape, where two of the and characters the are, with, are sea creatures. Where yes. two uh, characters yeah. are, are lizards. That maybe audiences still wanted from you a, a type of, of real. I don't think it's only from me. Uh, American audiences are far more comfortable with the illusion of naturalism in the theater than they are with any, with any kind of experimentation, with any kind of stylization. 
uh, we are a naturalistic theater culture. And audiences are much happier that way. And unless unless the, uh, you, uh, we're talking about comedies which are rip-offs of, of, of TV sitcoms, which are rip-offs rip of previous Broadway comedies. Unless we're talking about that. But serious plays, serious plays in the American theater, people want the illusion of naturalism. This isn't true in Europe. But I don't know why it's true in this country, but it is. We, you, we seem very rooted in, in mm -hmm. realism. And you do. I keep hearing about, I, I mean, I know looking, if you look back over the past 25 or 30 years, you keep hearing that... Um, certain people say realism is dead, but in a way audiences won't let it die and certain playwrights keep coming back to you it. You know, after, after Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov, and by the way, I saw the entire Peer Gint, the... Uh, so did I. Uh, in Hartford, we must yes. talk about that, either on or off the air, if you like. <laughs> um, after uh, Chekhov, Strindberg, and Ibsen, think of uh, three of the most ultimately uh, influential playwrights of the 20th century, uh, with Pirandello, Brecht and Beckett, n n n none of which is a naturalistic playwright. Or, or even comes close, mm -hmm. really. No. Uh, and, and there are three whom I admire enormously, of course. But, and of course, but they are, they are European. Uh, and uh, they're not American, I mean. No, you, they're not American. And if you look at, and some, a, a few, I mean, uh, O'Neill tried certain experiments, but they were very self-conscious in it. You know? Yeah, well, he, he tried a few Greek experiments and, and things, <laughs> yeah. yes. But now, I, let me, I do want to come back to Europe because you've been intrigued, it seems to me, almost from the beginning with, as you say, pushing the boundaries, you mm -hmm. mentioned that term, or trying different things. Um, whether it was, it's, was Seascape where you had these two characters that were uh, really like lizards, but mm -hmm. human, well, I mean, a, a larger lizards. Did, where, did, where did that idea come to you? Uh, where did you get that? Because that, that is more, it's, it's not quite like some of the other things you've done. I don't remember. I think it probably came from, or this is as good a guess as any, from looking around and beginning to wonder whether or not evolution had really taken place. Maybe that what was going on was a kind of devolution instead of evolution. And so I thought, I, I guess it, it all came from that, uh, putting together uh, supposedly highly advanced and sophisticated humans and uh, uh, less fortunate sea creatures and, and examine their relative uh, merits. Probably well, came from that. You got a lot of uh, fascinating juxtaposition by putting their values or their point of view as opposed to, was it Leslie and Sarah, the mm -hmm. two no, sea the creatures lizards, with yeah. Charlie and Nancy. Nancy. Mm. Uh, by juxtaposing that, you got a lot of humor out of that, of course. Uh, and uh, they, one of the things, it, did, was there originally a going to be a third act of that play? There was, for approximately one half of one rehearsal, a third act oh, of the really? play, yes. And then I realized it was going to be longer than the entire Ring of the Nibelungen. <laughs> And uh, I didn't like it, and it was created terrible set problems. Because the end of the first act was on the beach, the second act was at the bottom of the sea, and the third act was on the beach again. And it was endless, and uh, it didn't really accomplish what I was after. So, uh, obviously it was not meant to be, since I was able to go home after the first day of rehearsal. And, and w not just take out the entire second act, but with no more than an hour's work, I was able to turn it into the two-act play that had emerged. Oh, really? Yeah. It didn't take me long to do it. So I suspect I had probably been planning to turn it into a two-act play Somewhere. all along, but was, was unwilling to, 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 to uh, confront it to confront it until I uh, had the first day of rehearsal and sat there and as director and author both listened and turned to, to, to myself, uh, you know, one head director, one head author, we turned toward each other, looked and shook our heads. And, and decided do. we better go home and fix this. Is does that exist somewhere, just as a oh, sure. an archival kind yeah, of yeah, piece? Yeah, yeah, exists. Yeah. Uh, and someday somebody might see that and write a PhD dissertation on that. Uh, yeah, that's the only one that. Uh, no, another one um, under, underwent a, a transformation, rather unfortunate transformation, which I would like to see the the long version, the version that I originally wrote of my adaptation of Nabokov's Lolita. I would like to see that performed on stage someday. That was, that was two evenings. Two evenings? Well... That was a good, proper one, but through a combination of hideous circumstances, which I don't want to go into here, um, in, uh, that ended up being uh, an 
a partial evening of uh, only partially what I wrote, and uh, I don't want to Do get into Do you think it. Uh, anybody might uh, now? People are doing two evenings oh, now. Yeah, I've got, got, got a couple of You and I theaters. saw a Pierre Gant where, we did. where it was a, there was a matinee and an evening that you could see yeah. uh, in sequence. Now, I've got at least one fairly good regional theater that's interested in doing the uh, the two evening version of Lolita. So I've got to dig that up and look at it and see if I like it as much as I think I do. It could be a lot of fun. I yeah. mean, I, I mean, it could be fun to see if it's still... It was a lot fairer to the book because the book is so complex. Absolutely. And uh, I, I lost, or too much was lost. I didn't uh, do all of the cutting. Other people did. But too much was lost in, in putting it to the conventional length of a play. Well, nowadays, after things like Nicol Nicholas Nickleby and uh, some of the other things mm. that have been done, I mean, it's really more accepted now than it has been for a long, long time. Yeah, so you know, even American audiences will go to the no drama and exactly. sit there for five or six hours and not complain too much because they think they're having a cultural experience. You know? I think, don't you think we've adjusted to different lengths now in a way that we maybe didn't previously? Or? Length is a curious thing. Um, if a play, if any theatrical experience is the length that it should be, it's never too long or too short. You know, with, and that can be anywhere from three minutes to ten hours. How long does the play, I mentioned listening at the beginning of the half hour and we're almost out of the end of this, how long does it take for listening to play? I think listening is about uh, 55 minutes. 55 minutes. Mm. But people, actually people do plays nowadays that are that length or oh, not, yeah. just slightly longer mm -hmm. than that. And, yeah. But it's, is it usually coupled with counting the ways? It's usually it? coupled with counting the ways because I thought it was a nice contrast. And then again, it was another play by me and I sort of liked the, the ring of that. Well, and there, there are certain, certain things in technique that are similar. It's broken up into mm -hmm. segments, both yeah. of them. Right. The numbers are called out in, in listen. Uh, a listen. very nice lady from Dallas wrote me, wrote me a letter when I was teaching down in Houston, as I do at the University of Houston every spring, wrote me a very nice letter saying she just finished reading Listening, which she thought was a very interesting play, but she didn't understand why you had the numbers from 1 to 20 called out. Could you, could you please uh, uh, explain that? And I had to tell her I didn't remember. <laughs> well, on that notion of length, and uh, of intermittent moments within the play, we have to end this half hour. Edward, thank you very my much pleasure. for being here. This has been the Harold Clerman Seminar on Theatre. I'm Ed Wilson. My guest has been Edward Albee. Thank you for being with us. The preceding program was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America.